This year, I, this year people can sit wherever they want, wherever they feel comfortable. Can I sit up there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, as we have a few minutes before we begin, I encourage you to take some time of just silent meditation and reflection, self-examination. Feel free to read the back of the bulletin, which talks about what Lent is, what Ash Wednesday is, why we are here, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes.
everyone that's here in the sanctuary and we have a few of you online we want to welcome you to this ash wednesday service ash wednesday is the beginning of lent and lent is a season where we take inventory of where we are in our christian walk we prepare our hearts for resurrection sunday and so tonight we, we want to remember three things we're here one to remember our mortality the fact that from dust we were created and to dust we will return. Second, we want to recognize our sin. We recognize the fact that we fall short of God's standards, uh, and that includes us as Christians, that we do that as well. But the third thing we need to remember, and this is uh, looking forward, is the hope that we have in Christ. And we experience part of that hope now in the fact that we have the assurance that Jesus Christ has died and rose from the dead, and, and therefore, in him, we have forgiveness of sins, and that one day he will return, and we won't struggle with sin anymore. And that's our hope and our longing, and that this time of Lent, this Lenten season, will not be something that we practice in heaven, because we won't need it, but we do need it now. So, with that said, I encourage you, open your bulletins, and join me for our opening prayer, and feel free to stay seated. And this comes from the 25th Psalm. Let us pray. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress, and take away all my sins. Amen. Please stand and join me for our first hymn, Just As I Am, number 342, Just As I Am. Amen. 
Uh, have a seat. Keep your hymnals open as we turn to our responsive reading this evening, the Ten Commandments, number 629. It's the first of the responsive readings in the back. I will read the light print if you please respond in the bold. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work, uh, shalt thou labor, and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maidservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And listen, those were the Ten Commandments, but let me read to you the greatest commandment that Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, testified, attested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Well, today is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, a season of spiritual renewal to prepare for Easter. And of course, all spiritual renewal has to include repentance. Now, what is repentance? I remember when we had... Uh, Oh, why am I not? Alpha, when we did Alpha. And Nikki Gumbles came very clearly said, here's what repentance is. It's simply saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it's agreeing with God about your sin. In fact, the term in the Greek is called metanoia, which means to turn from going in one direction away from God and towards sin and to turn to God and away from sin. That is what repentance is all about. It's admitting to God, I'm not living like I should. I'm not acting like I should. I'm not talking like I should. God, forgive me. Help me. I want to live for you. So let's begin with the what of repentance. What do we repent of? Well, we repent of our sins, our wrongs, our mistakes. But how do we know if something is a sin? Well, if you've done something you shouldn't have done, or if you have not done something that you think you should do, a lot of times... Your conscience will tell you if your conscience is working correctly. Especially as a Christian, we have God's spirit living in us, guiding us and telling us. We know on the inside that we've done something wrong, but sometimes that's not always the case. Because Jesus tells us sometimes we have a log in our eyes and we are blind to our sin, our flaws. And we're blind to how we've hurt others. 
So in that case, the best way to find out is to do something very courageous. And that is to ask someone who knows you well. For many of you, it's your spouse. They, are en they have an endless wisdom of your flaws. Trust me, I know. Actually, my wife knows more than I know. So, Or talk with your children, especially you grown adults. I'm sure they can see things. Or if you're the young ones here, talk to your parents. They know you. They can tell you. But again, that's something that is, takes a little courage to do. Now, there's two ways that we can repent. One is to simply repent because we got caught and we want to get out of trouble. That certainly uh, is one thing. But there's another deeper repentance where we realize we've hurt someone and we want to make things right. Now, in that case, we're getting to something truer and deeper, more authentic. Now, even if it's we've hurt someone, a fellow person, every sin we commit is always a sin against God first and foremost. That's what the first commandment is about, not having any other gods before us, because whenever we sin, sin is always saying to God, whatever the sin is, God, I'm going to do it my way, not your way. We become the master, and God becomes, in a sense, an advisor at best, instead of Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Thus, it's necessary not only to repent uh, the wrongs we have done, but how, we ha how those wrongs have hurt others, including God himself. That is, in a sense, why we repent. Um, excuse me, that's what we repent of. I'm sorry, excuse me. So now we get to the why. Why do we repent? Um, I don't want to put you two on the spot, but since you're the only kids here, has your mom and dad ever forced you guys to say you're sorry to each other, even though you know you weren't sorry? Oh, Madeline's shaking her head big time. You do it, right? Because you don't want to get in more trouble, but deep down, are you really sorry yet? Uh, yeah, maybe. That's a good answer. You don't know, because something maybe you are, but maybe you aren't. But you still say you're sorry, because, yeah, make mom and dad happy. I had that happen to me when I was growing up, too. I had to say I'm sorry to my siblings all the time, and I can tell you, Probably 99 out of 100 times that I wasn't sorry in the slightest. But there were other times when I was sorry. And those times, my, my parents and I might not even known that I did something to my brother or sister. But I knew I had hurt them. And so it was important for me to come and to uh, say I'm sorry to them. And that, that repentance was real. I wasn't just going through the motions. And the same thing with the Lord as well. It's good for us to come here tonight and to look at ourselves at self-examination and, and ask God for forgiveness. But if we're doing it just going through the motions, then that's, that's one level of repentance. The Lord's asking us to go to a deeper level, to examine what is going on in our hearts and how we have hurt others and how we have hurt God by our sinful action. So that's why we repent. We want to get things right. So how are we able to repent? Well, this is where... It gets hard because repentance is hard. It's not easy to admit that we did something wrong. We're much more likely to say that we made a mistake or that we can blame others or blame our situation. Um, you know, you say, you know, I didn't get enough sleep last night. I'm hangry. And so, you know, I'm sorry I lash out you. I'm so hungry. Or we minimize our sins, say, yeah, it wasn't that big of a deal. See, our pride really hates to admit that we've done something wrong to God or others. It's embarrassing. It's shameful, especially as Christians, because we know we shouldn't be acting this way. So how do we able to swallow our pride, our pride and repent? Well, one of the problems is that we don't want others to think less of us. That's why we don't go as quickly as we should to ask for forgiveness. We don't want to risk rejection. But does that apply with God? Because sometimes we act that way with God. You think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they first sinned. God came, it came to them after they sinned. What did they do? Did they run to God ask for forgiveness? No. They went and hid in the trees like God wouldn't find them. They went and hid. And we do that too. When we, don't go to God, if, when we sin and we, stay, we don't go to God in repentance, we take our time, that's the same thing as basically hiding in the trees like Adam and Eve. But the truth is, <coughs> excuse me, if you are a Christian, God loves you today 
as much as he's going to love you 10,000 years from now. And that love was proven to us and showed to us at the cross. God says, I love you this much. And because we are Christians, we don't have to worry about being in God's, be on God's angry list, like he's Santa or something. Because Jesus Christ has taken all the wrath, all the judgment at the cross. And therefore the Bible says that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Knowing this, that God absolutely loves you and will never reject you, that knowing that actually can free you to ask God for forgiveness. Because you know, God, our Father is a good Father, and He's full of mercy and grace. So that's how we're able to repent. When? When do we repent? Well, that's easy. We repent one time a year right now. That's it. You get it all over with. You get it all over for next year too, all right? Well, no. No, of course not. We should repent as often as we sin. Knowing that God loves you and wants to forgive you means that you shouldn't have to wait until your sin bucket is full and brimming over with your sin and finally say, oh man, this bucket is really full. I better take care of it now. No. We need to keep short accounts with the Lord. Keep that bucket. You'll always be dumping that bucket. And I should say keep short accounts not just with the Lord, but also with each other as well. The answer to when we should pray is always the same. Now, today is the day of our salvation. Today is the day when we repent. So who? Who does repentance make us? In short, repentance makes us more humble and less prideful. And because of that, repentance makes us more authentic. We aren't trying to hide our sin. We aren't trying to pretend we are something other than we are. We aren't trying to cover up our sin. Repentance also actually makes us more thankful and grateful. Because when we confess to God, guess what God does? He forgives us right away. He doesn't hold it over our heads. He doesn't hold it against us. He doesn't say, well, I'll think about it. But you know, Jim, it's been, you've been sitting quite a bit lately. I'm going to keep this one in my back pocket. I'm going to wait. No, God forgives us immediately because that's who he is. He loves to forgive. He loves to shower us with grace and mercy when we humble ourselves before him. And that's the key. We humble ourselves before him. And finally, there's one other thing about who we become when we repent and receive forgiveness from God. We become better forgivers ourselves. Knowing how much we've sinned, knowing the depths of our own sin, and God's forgiveness will make it so much easier to forgive others when they sin against you. When they say something or do something that hurts you in some way. Why? Because you know how much you've been forgiven by God, therefore... How could you then turn around and not give that same love and grace and mercy that God has shown you to them? That is who repentance makes us. So I challenge you this evening to take some time for self-examination. Talk with your spouse. Talk with your parents. Talk with your children. Ask them if there's anything you need to repent of, any flaws, any logs in your own eye that you don't see. Now, I bet some of you already know what you need to repent of, who you need to go and ask for forgiveness of, and if that's you, you don't need self-examination. You just need to go and do it. Swallow your pride, go to God and anyone else, and repent. And hopefully they will forgive you and you can experience a fresh new relationship with them. But even if they reject your forgiveness, know that God always honors your actions to try and make things right. And as far as it goes with him, God will never reject your repentance and will always forgive you. To that we say amen and amen, and that's why we're here this evening. To help us tonight as we seek to have uh, some time of confession, we're going to begin by looking in the back of the hymnal for a general confession. Following the general confession, we're going to have time a silent confession. And you can feel free to use the uh, outline of the general confession for your own time of silent, more specific uh, confession. This is helpful, but obviously if there's things on your heart the Lord's placing on you, a general confession like this is, is inadequate. You need to go to him about the things specifically that he's put on your heart. So let us together uh, confess our sin to the Lord using this general confession. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts, 
we have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind through Jesus Christ our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Let's have a time of silent confession. Having confessed our sins, I invite you to turn to Psalm 103 in your pew Bibles as we hear what God does with those sins. Psalm 103, page 939 in your pew Bibles. I will read the odd number if you please respond in the even number. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like, are, like the, are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep his covenant, and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly host, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. 
Well, we're going to continue with the imposition of the ashes. It is the kind of key, uh, uh, what do I say, worship act of our evening tonight. And we do this because ash reminds us, as we just read, that it's dust, that uh, we are formed from dust and we will go to dust. It reminds us of our mor mortality, that this life is not... Uh, does not continue forever, but that there is a greater life in store for us. Uh, it also reminds us of our sin, because in the Old Testament, when someone was convicted of their sin, or something grievous happened to them, they often would tear their robe and put dust on themselves as a sign of mourning. And so we put the ashes on as a sign of our mourning over our sin. But... The ash, of course, is put in the sign of a cross, which reminds us of the hope that we have, that we're not just stuck with this sin. We're not just stuck with the fact that we're going to die, but we have the wonderful truth that Jesus rose from the dead, and so shall we. And he rose from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins, and that is our hope. So we're going to do something a little different tonight. If, you'll be with, if you're will be if you okay with me, uh, you're always willing to try new things, so I appreciate you people. Uh, as I studied Nehemiah 8 this week, which is my sermon on Sunday, I noticed that they were very much intentional about their motions and actions. And so uh, what I have here is a kneeler that I received from my parents and grandparents on my ordination. And so I brought it. And let me encourage you, what I'd like you to do is we'll come up where Jim is here on this side. And if you're willing to kneel, kneel, and then I'll do the sign of the cross. If you're not willing to kneel, then then don't. It's America. You're not forced to do anything you don't want to, all right? Um, and then whoever is last, if you, if, and that might be Diane, if you're willing to do the imposition for me, I would appreciate it. All right. Mr. Bernie, question and answer time. Don't have a problem kneeling. i got to have somebody help me get up. We, I'll, we'll make sure we get some help for you, all right? So, Jim, if you want to start, and we'll have a line come this way, and once you're done, we'll just have you go up the center aisle. Place your hope in Christ. Dottie, daughter of Eve, remember thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Bernie, remember that thou art dust, and to dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. No, I can make it with that. All right, all right. No problem. Tammy, daughter of Eve, remember thou art dust, and the dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Karen, daughter of Eve, remember thou art dust, and the dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Terry, son of Adam, Remember thou art dust, and the dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Eliana, daughter of Eve, remember thou art dust, and the dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Sorry, I didn't know you this. Madeline, daughter of Eve, remember thou art dust, and the dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Diane, daughter of Eve, remember thou art dust, and dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Sarah, daughter of Eve, remember thou art dust, and dust thou shalt return. Place your hope in Christ. Remember.
remember, Lucas, that thou art dust, to dust thou, from dust thou didst come, and to dust thou shalt return. Repent of your sins, and have hope only in your Lord Jesus Christ. My apologies. Some of you got extra dust all over your nose and glasses. My, my apologies. Some of you, apparently you needed it. All right. Let us celebrate the fact that we have forgiveness of sins and that the Lord creates a clean heart in all those who desire it. If you'll join me, our song is actually at the bottom of the, in the bulletin, at the bottom right-hand side. And please stand, Create in me a clean heart. have a seat. It's right for us, having confessed our sins and heard, hearing from Scripture the forgiveness thereof, for us to take part in communion tonight to remember our Lord's death, um, as that is what Lent is about. We, we remember the Lord's death and we prepare for his coming again, which of course, that is what the bread and the cup remind us of, his death and the promise that one day the Lord said, I'm not going to eat this meal again until I am with you um, and my great banqueting table. So uh, I will pass the elements around. So there's only a few of us tonight, and then we will partake of them. Passover meal, Jesus took the bread, passed it to his disciples, broke it, and said, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten of the bread, Jesus took the cup and passed it to his followers as well, and we do the same this evening.
the covenant of my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin, brings us in remembrance of you. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for the cup and the bread, especially tonight. It's good for us to take time to recognize our faults, our weaknesses, our flaws, the fact that we are mortal, the fact that we still deal with sin in our life on this side of, of eternity. But Father, coming to the table reminds us once again what you did for us. You did something about it. You don't expect us to uh, be perfect. You don't expect us to work off our set debt sin to you. Instead, you have done all that is needed for us. And we were your body broken, your blood shed. That is the offering that Jesus presented to you. And in that, through faith, we have forgiveness of sin. We have newness of life. We are cleansed. And we give you thanks. So we ask you this Lenten season that we might renew our spiritual lives before you. That we might deepen them and prepare our hearts to celebrate Easter in a truly uh, wonderful, awesome way as we've taken time to navigate our, our own sin and to turn to you once again. So help us, we pray, by, the, by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, in response to what the Lord... Oh, before we do that, I should have closed with the Lord's Prayer, that prayer. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to do the... Uh, the special offering, and I'll give a prayer a thanks after, and we'll do the Lord's Prayer with that. But tonight, uh, we are taking an offering in response to all that the Lord has done for us. This offering goes to uh, the missions that we support. Um, Ned and Marlene McGrady, Young Life, jo Jerome Question Outreach Center, and Salvation Army. So let me ask, actually, Madeline and Eliana, you guys want to come up and help me with the offering? <laughs> final hymn this evening is the same one I pick every year. Be Thou My Vision, because it is the goal of what Lent should be, that we make God our vision and the our heart's desire, obviously all year round, but especially during the season of Lent. So please join me for uh, the hymn, Be Thou My Vision, 382. If you're able to, please stand. 382, Be Thou My Vision.
hear now the benediction. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace and mercy this evening.